It's possibly on the shirt, so I might take this off when I get to you. I'm now the sort of uh, technological man with batteries in my pockets and that speaker stuck on my shirt. It's my second dressing up this season. <laughs> uh, it's good to be with you this morning and uh, be able to worship together and get that nice flow of the music, but uh, it's good to see the truth that we sing. That's very important, isn't it? There's always a danger with lots of things. You can get caught up on the, the sort of just the feelings or the outward outward sort of look but what is it that's really real in it and uh, the Lord obviously wants us to be real to him in our hearts and he meets us in his own his own wonderful way it was about four years ago or so that I was here with you my wife was with me at that time she's not here and just for your information she's in a care home in Shepshed been there for nearly three years and been going through the process of Alzheimer's last medical assessment that she has severe dementia but you just have to say, thank you, Lord, you're there. Amen. You know, one of the great truths I've come to appreciate so much is where it says, for instance, in the word of God, Christ in us, the hope of glory. And when you're with a loved one who at this point now understands very little that I say, hasn't been able to speak to you for over three years, to know that Jesus is right there in her, in me, hey, you tell me a better communication system than that. I'm, I'm not just putting it on. This is real to me. What better communication system? God in my wife, God in me. And there are times, well, they're very, they're very wonderful times. We can just look in each other's eyes and just sort of see one another and sense the Lord right there. That's precious. Amen. You know, I could, be, I could be negative and I could just be thinking on the on the condition and all that. And it's true for all of us in so many situations. Don't get caught up with your circumstances. See your circumstances. You say, I'm a child of God. As we've been singing, he's in control. You know, he has an eternal love. He'll work it out for us. However young we are, however old we are, the Lord is consistent. He's faithful all the time. Amen. I... Uh, I don't often preach now or speak, uh, mainly because I, I feel that one of my priorities, the priority outside of the Lord, is to go and visit my wife on a regular basis and spend time with her. Because she can't speak, the tendency is that people don't often go near her. And I'm not saying they do that deliberately in one sense, but, you know, staff are very busy, carers are very busy in the homes. The ratio between the number of people being cared for, it tends to be minimal and they're, they're busy people. They, they, I know they love Ruth, and uh, uh, I know that the Lord's given an opportunity to share him in their situation. So that's part of the scenario why it isn't very often I'm preaching, although, uh, may, may, uh, wonder of wonders, I was only preaching two weeks ago, but this is, a rare, <laughs> this is a rare time. So if I feel a bit rusty this morning, if you think you've got an old guy speaking to you, you're right, you have got, you have got an old guy speaking to you. I'm 80 now. I've been a Christian for over 60 years. And isn't he wonderful? Amen. Praise the Lord. If there's anything and anybody you can really get excited about is who the Lord is and what he's done for us and what he's doing. But you know, we're in a growing situation, but I'll come to that in a moment. On the table, as you see, there, there's literature and I want to encourage you to feel free indeed to take that. In fact, if you really want to, you can take one of these books free of charge. Okay? Open Doors is no longer selling books because they felt some time back that they didn't want to invest thousands and thousands of pounds into the stock, when in fact the giving and the objective is to support the persecuted church, to effectively represent the church here in this country and to be reaching out to our brothers and sisters out there. So these, there are three books there. There's two of these. It's a, it's a very good book. It's got some wonderful testimonies as well, etc. And the one in the middle called Light Force is uh, about... Uh, mainly about the, the Lord's work through Open Doors uh, with the Palestinians or the Arab peoples uh, in their situations. Now, they're not up to date, but a lot of the truth is there, which is up to date. Uh, and the situation, although it's changing, it's probably going to get worse because persecution is growing. The church is growing, which is great news. Amen? Amen. And uh, the Lord is so wonderfully at work. Um, we have what we call standing strong 
which is a very special teaching ministry to the persecuted church where they are, and I have been involved in that. But we hold every year special conferences. And there's one in Birmingham on the 17th of November, and it will, it will be uh, held there at the Bethel Convention Centre. And there are actually members of the persecuted church who will be there sharing their testimonies, sharing and giving insights to us. And that makes it very, very special. Uh, and it's very unique in that way. So if you're interested, there's one or two of those there on, on the table. Uh, and the basic details are there also. We put out a magazine every other month. Uh, and there's the July issue there, uh, which do, do take a copy. Read for yourselves some of the things that are going on, the testimonies, the nitty-gritty of being really under persecution. Uh, September this month, uh, we're majoring on India. And I'll be saying something about um, these areas. I will be using the articles. I will just be selecting things which I've underlined to, and so forth because uh, it's not easy to memorise a lot of details, as most of you probably know. You don't have to be 60 to, or 80 to find out you've got a problem memorising. <laughs> Probably some of you young people wish I had a better memory than I've got. But there you are, we have to work at it. And lastly, if you want to respond to get contact from Open Doors, receive the magazine. We have a, youth, we have a very developed youth work for the church here in this country. And there are special materials, etc., that can be used by youth groups, your own group here and others. And there are quite a number of churches who are feeding into that. And young people who find themselves going out on special projects that we actually do in countries where there is persecution. Now, we don't stick you in the middle of the persecution, okay? There are uh, very careful arrangements made, so we're, <laughs> we're not going to say, watch out, they're going to open up, <laughs> you know, they're going to lob a, a grenade at us or something like that. It's not quite that situation, although it may be happening, it might be happening in some other part of the country, but the visit is in a safe area, and the church on the ground are the ones who know, and so there's a constant flow of information about it. But if you want to respond, there's these little uh, uh, forms, and there's a pen there, and if you use the pen, please put it back again. <laughs> That's my favourite poem, that is. <laughs> so there's two little piles, but it'd be lovely if some of you feel, yeah, I'd like to be informed, I'd like to know what's happening to my brothers and sisters, the young people, the old people, and all that's going on at this time. Right, if you've got a Bible and uh, you want to open it or you just want to sit and listen to the reading, uh, we're going to read from the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews, it's called the Book of Hebrews because it's written to the Hebrews. These were believers, uh, uh, most of them believers who were having a problem because they were mixing up the law with the gospel. They were trying to get back to do this, do this, do that and all the rest of it when, well, we've been singing this morning, Jesus has paid the price. He's done it all for us. And uh, the devil, the human nature was mixing it all up and it was getting a problem and um, they had suffered persecution, and we will be touching on that this morning. Um, the writer to the Hebrews, let's say it's Paul. It's not certain it was Paul, but I'll probably tend to say Paul said or Paul did this or whatever. So don't worry. Um, so Hebrews chapter, chapter 10. Uh, and um, I'm going to uh, take the reading up from uh, the verse 11. I mean, the whole chapter is appropriate, but we're going to take it up from the verse 11 of Hebrews 10. And he says, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So regularly they made those sacrifices by what God had commanded them to do, but it could only bring the forgiveness of sin at that moment, and then they need to have another sacrifice according to the situation. But he, referring to God, to Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, uh, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind I will write them. He then says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. 
Now where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. So we know God has made a once and for all sacrifice by himself standing in and doing what he has done for us on the cross of Calvary. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's not saying, you know, we, need, we get clean by being washed with clean, pure water, but referring to baptism as a, a testimony of what God has done in our lives. So sometimes it always isn't clear, so we need to understand the background sometimes. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I want to then move on to the verse 32. Not that the other is appropriate, but this just helps the, the amount of reading there is in this. Verse 32. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. I noticed in one of the latter songs of the group, it made reference to the re return of the Lord. That, that should be a great challenge to us in our, our living and, and the reality of faith. Verse 38, But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. So this morning, the, as we've read this, the, the Hebrews, the, the people to whom this letter was written, are being very much encouraged to consider the Lord Jesus Christ and his life and his sacrifice and what he has actually done for us. And we are to be relying totally on what he's done for us. Sometimes when we get in a bit of a mess, we start thinking of things that we, good things that we can do sometimes just to please God. Well, that, that won't make any difference about our sin. And in fact, it's questioning maybe our total confidence in the Lord. You know, a bit of doing good here and a little bit of doing good there uh, makes me more acceptable. That's a very natural response by human nature. But it won't help us because it's really trying to, in a sense, taking away the value of what Jesus has done for us and who he is and what he says in his word and the wonderful promises that he makes uh, for us. My underlying theme this morning, very encouraging theme, is are you prepared for persecution? Are we preparing for persecution? You see, because slowly in our country we are seeing the evidence of people who are Christians who have been persecuted. We've had court cases. We've had preachers uh, arrested by the police on certain occasions and, uh, and they've been charged. Or they're through the intervention of a lawyer or a, a solicitor and so forth, the situation has been clarified and no other steps have been taken. But we are, we are seeing and have been seeing within the last 10 years or so uh, a, a beginning of the creeping of persecution, the discrimination uh, against Christians. I think one of the most vociferous groups, uh, it, does, it, it can be Christians who maybe don't agree with them, but other groups, the LGBT situation, and those who are the upfront people, they just don't have any time to hear any explanation that's different from what they believe. And that's unfortunately what's happening. 
and uh, they're not helping the situation at all. And Christians are being very much targeted when they come into that sort of area. But God is working out his plan. He's got a, a wonderful story. I expect you've heard the word history and people say history means his story. Just a play on, on words. God is at work all the time. It's his creation, isn't it? It's his world. I don't know if you've, uh, I could have brought it this morning, but I didn't think about it. I bought a book very recently called Creation, and uh, it's written by some uh, three, basically three Christians with very qualified scientists, and many of them are Christians, revealing to us very interesting things about creation, very unique things, which tells us that creation is not evolution. It's creation. It's God's handiwork. He's done it. You take a blood, bloodhound, for instance, they're not uh, the best looking dog in the world, are they? You know, they've got a long face and a big nose and big ears, you know. They come down, even touches the ground and so forth. And it has all these rolls of skin under here. But you know, that is all part of the ability of that dog to be the best <laughs> sniffer out of any other dog in the world. Did you know that? Well, I didn't until I read this book. Just give you a quick illustration. The ears. They're deliberately big, they touch the ground, they pick up the material as they go along and it's got there on its ears the material that it can be analysing. Half of its nose takes in half the uh, oxygen one side to, to live. You know, oxygen is helpful to live. Uh, <laughs> and the other half is to analyse what it's sniffing. The nose, you, just inside there's a flap. And this amazing dog called the Bloodhound, absolutely wonderful. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's just one of so many wonderful evidences of God's creation. And um, if God can design an animal to know that, you know, specialise, the wonderful thing is God specialises in everything. Amen. <laughs> he can deal with anything. He can analyse it. He understands it. And he knows what we are saying, what we are looking for, what we are needing. We don't have to go to a psychiatrist to make our way to God. We don't even have to go to a pastor to make our way to God. Whew, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry, Julian. I've, I, I've been a, I have been a pastor, a missionary. I've uh, been many things that God has given me to do. And uh, we understand what our role and our calling is. But isn't it wonderful that God, in his wonderful wisdom, the way he designs us and the way he's made it possible for us to be able to approach him. But man in himself doesn't know God. You know, we're born not knowing God. We're born with a, a sinful nature which is, hey, I want to do my thing. I, I remember reading quite recently, and I, I'm just going to take out the... Uh, um, Frank Sinatra. How many of you have heard Frank Sinatra? The young people heard of Frank Sinatra? Yeah, they should have. They should have. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> right. Well, I'll accept that as <laughs> Frank Sinatra, great crooner, lovely voice. Amen. But he was asked on one occasion about um, give a sum up of what he believed in his religious, and he says this: First, I believe in you and me. Okay, a lot of people are on that now. You know, it's all about me and I. Uh, God, well, uh, no, me. God, no, I. And then he says, I'm like Albert Schweitzer and Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein in that I have a respect for life in any form. I believe in nature, in the birds, the sea, the sky and everything. I can see that there is real evidence for. If these things are what you mean by God, then I believe in God. And that's where Frank Sinatra was. If, uh, you know, he, he, creation and uh, the beauty of creation, then as far as he was concerned, that was God. But he didn't really believe in a personal creator. He obviously didn't have his, um, his eyes, as it were, of faith uh, fixed upon the person uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, a slightly humorous approach is about the little boy who was praying. And he was praying to God. And uh, he says, Lord, if you can't make me a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a great time. <laughs> and this is what even mature people, you know, they, they say, well, I'm not worried about God. I'm doing okay. You know, according to what we understand okay is. But we really need to keep, to know the Lord and to keep our, uh, our eyes on him. 
But there are those we know uh, who are antagonistic uh, against the Lord and they, they are antagonistic against Christians. In this country, there's a growing anti-Christian attitude. There is no doubt about that. Mind you, some of the things that the church, in quotes, does and says, I'm not surprised that some people say, yeah, well, what about that then? What about that that was done? What about that that was said? And if they just take those examples, they've got reason. Ah, but when it comes down to the person of God, when it comes down to what the Bible says, at the end of the day, they haven't got sufficient reason. But Amen. we understand that is the battle that uh, is going on and that Jesus has made the provision uh, for us. I was reading an article not so long ago. Um, I'm involved in a couple of prayer groups. We, we meet every week. One week we're praying for an hour or more for the nation. So I'm connecting into Christian Institute and so forth, getting information through online. And then, um, and then the, the second week we add another hour and we pray for Israel. And we pray for Israel because Israel holds a very major place still in the scriptures, unfulfilled prophecies. One of the greatest signs of the Lord's coming is what God is doing with Israel and the way God is going to use Israel. And by the way, where is the landing strip that Jesus is going to use when he lands? Is it East Row? Is it down, you know, down in some part of England? No, the, when he comes down, he's going to come right down and his feet, it says in Zechariah, are going to rest on Mount Olives. Amen. So th that's going to happen. And keep your eye on what's happening in the Middle East. Russia is right back in the driving seat again. For years... They, they, they got pushed out of the Middle East by the influence of the United States. Then when President Obama came in, he neglected. And many Americans were very disappointed with President Obama in a number of things. But that was one of them, that the United States lost a lot of its clout, you know, politically. And therefore, um, uh, militarily, they weren't there where they used to be. And that vacuum that came about Mind you, this is all part of God's plan. <laughs> what an encouragement. Uh, Russia is right back in the driving seat. And all sorts of things are going on uh, with Russia and Syria. And Israel, God is just working. And you know, in Israel, many, many Jewish people are turning to Jesus. There are at least fifteen to 20,000 born-again Jews inside of the borders of Israel today. And it's estimated probably 350,000 possible Jews who are followers of Jesus in other parts of the world, including the figure that I've quoted for Israel. Signs. But persecution is coming. Some 30 years ago, several prophecies came out from different parts of the church in this country saying that um, persecution is coming. And it seemed as though most Christians say, well, you know, we'll see or I go on. Look at our country. Traditionally Christian, Christianity is established. We've got all these churches and cathedrals and all the rest of it. But you see, it's been in, within 50 years, it's almost completely changed. But praise the Lord, the church is still growing. Amen. The church is still here. Well, I mean, I heard it this morning very clearly when I was here. <laughs> You know, we're still here. God is still fulfilling his plan. So persecution isn't just happening out there. It has started to happen here and it will get worse. But we will prove that God is the, he is the God of Judah. He is the Lion of Judah. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Almighty One. He is the champion. He is the one who undertakes for us. So we need to be aware of that and what uh, is going on. In, in respect to the situation and the world and time in which we're living at this time. I remember years ago when I was pastor at Barrow Baptist Church that I became aware that one of the worst areas where people in this country were being discriminated against and finding it difficult because they had made it known they were Christians was young people in our schools. And I think that's still true to a considerable degree. Young people who... I, I mean, I was told of one case where a young girl in, a, in a, um, uh, an essay, an essay she had to write, she had to, uh, used illustrations, whatever, about Christianity. She was failed. And they found out the teacher failed her because of the Christian content. And that's going back nearly 20 years. 
So you see, this persecution, discrimination is going on. It's been happening. But let us come down to a bit more of um, about uh, Open Doors and what we're doing. We're working in some 50 nations of the world. Um, got some faces here. <laughs> These are faces that represent various countries, various ministries in pastors, leaders, workers. These are people from obviously different countries, you can tell by their appearances. And they're just representative of us, the family of God. And we, every year, we put out what we called a world watch list. I don't know if any of you receive, do any of you receive literature at all from Open Doors? You do? Okay, what do you receive? Don't forget the magazine every month. You do? Okay, great, that's great. And, um, you know, we need to be informed, we need to be aware. The World Watch list for 2018, um, there was a, a, a map, I don't know if it was sent with the actual book at the time, but the World Watch list with the map. There are two maps. First of all, the one that can be put up as a poster in, in your church or in your home, wherever. And all the 50 nations, there are 49 questions are asked every time about every one of the nations to see what is actually happening. And then it's redone every year. So there's a lot of work goes in to this investigation. So it's, it is very reliable. We're not depending on a bit of information here or there. It, it's very professionally and very much done as unto the Lord. So you've got that. You've got the world with these uh, different numbers. And um, the reason why we've got those different numbers is so that if you've got the book, which you're probably aware of, is that when you open the book, you have those 50 nations, you have a photograph of someone, you have something about that nation, and it's got a number. Okay? So you think, North Korea, where's North Korea? So you look at the map, where's number one? Find number one, you got it. So you can go right through the year, or obviously there's more, more than 50 days in a year if you do it every day, and you can go back through, but you can be keep, keep informed from open doors about developments. I mean, are things happening in North Korea? Yeah, they are, aren't they? They are happening. In fact, I think it was the said today, and I'm not sure whether it was yesterday, they had this, this oh, there's 70 year, there's a 70 years special celebration uh, of the 70 years that North Korea uh, has been in existence as North Korea on its own as a country. Obviously, it's communist, very strongly atheistic. For the first time in their national parade, there were no missiles. There was no hard military hardware. And that, is, as we understand it, has come out of the talks with President Trump. Now, I'm not a politician, but I tell you what, I gather information. And this, isn't, this wouldn't surprise you. President Trump is quite a unique president, wouldn't you say? <laughs> you know, some people say, did you say chump? No, I'm not going to insult. You should never insult. You know, God put him in place. Amen. Margaret... Um, Theresa May, sorry, Theresa May, put in place by God. All leaders are allowed and put in place by God because he's in control. He is the final authority. You'll find that in the word of God. It says he raises up leaders and he removes them. And I want to say that, boy, God has really shaken uh, the United States in some ways, in good ways. Um... Promises made by the presidents of the United States year after year, certain things are kept putting off. Donald Trump comes in. My name's Donald, by the way, so <laughs> watch out. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, he, has, he has fulfilled them. And some people say, well, good, good on you, mate. You know, good on you. But yes, he is not everybody's flavour of the month, as we say. But God has put him there for a purpose, very definitely. Look at the way he's supporting uh, uh, Israel at this time. That has really changed the scene. Now we know, we, those of us who know our Bibles, and we, we know what the Word of God says prophetically, we know there's going to be a final almighty uh, clash, and Israel will be literally being destroyed by a combination of Islamic uh, nations and other nations coming down and overrunning and attacking the land of Israel.
and other types of literature into various nations throughout the world. And um, that included 128,000 children's Bibles. That included other, other items of literature. Um, we also taught people, okay? We taught discipleship courses, trauma care training, persecution, etc. But now, let me say this, which provided trauma counselling training for more than 42,000 people. So out of that um, half a million, they became trainers and they trained over another 42,000. And that's the way it should be. And we just keep multiplying because the need is so great. The, the, the pressure is so great upon the church. And they are needing such uh, tremendous help um, in their lives. I mentioned North Korea. You know, North Korea is the worst place you could probably live anywhere in the world. Anybody been to North Korea here? Okay, right. I haven't been, but we, we have run certain visits. We've done open doors over the years, gone as a group of, um, in quotes, tourists, <laughs> who've gone in, and very discreetly, we're praying. The main purpose is to pray in North Korea for the North Korean people, for the believers in North Korea. There's probably about 400,000 Christians, as far as we can tell, in North Korea. All of them have to meet in secret. It's like a police state. Everybody watches everybody else. Everybody's looking what their neighbour is doing because the authorities offer rewards and encouragements if you report on your neighbour and they're found to be against you know, the regime, whether you're a Christian or you've got another political persuasion, whatever it is. And this is the atmosphere. Can you imagine that? Uh, you, uh, I don't know, if you've got someone in your street, you know, Mrs Brown, she's always peeping behind the curtain. You know, we, we've had that, that's part of our culture, but boy, that's nothing, is it, when you consider that in North Korea, Mrs. Brown would be an informer, probably, to the police or you know, the authorities, and you'd be arrested. If you are found as a, an enemy of North Korea, say you're a Christian, just give an example without detail, a family has children, they have a Bible, and that Bible is hidden in a certain place in a part of the house. They read that Bible every day when it's all, everything's secure in their home with their children. Child goes to school. The teachers try and use the children to find out who are the so-called enemies of the state. And they question children. And just one example, one child was gradually questioned and they found out that the parents hid a little book the girl didn't quite understand what it was, a little book in the, the, the armrest of the sofa in the front room. One day, big thundering at the door, in come the police. They go in, they go straight to that place that the child had talked about, and sure enough, there was a copy of the New Testament or the Bible. You know what happens then? The whole family is arrested. Four generations are put in prison. The present mum and dad, their children, and any grandchildren and children of their grandchildren, who are maybe not Christians even, but they're all arrested because they're part of that family and they're put in prison, but I can also have to say sadly, sometimes they're all executed. They're all put to death. And you never know exactly how severe the, uh, the results of that might be. Would you like to live in that sort of situation, of course we wouldn't. But we can identify with them. We read here about those who identify with those in prison, as though you are in prison with them. And you know, through prayer, we can go, you don't have to go and get a ticket, you know, with East Midlands. You don't have to get an aircraft. We can go and visit the person in prison, the person who's suffering, through prayer. Amen. We can go to the centre of all creation, we can go to the Sovereign Lord and we can call out in the name of Jesus. And that's what he wants us to do. To learn to be people who pray and are willing to pray. I know it's hard. I've worked at it for over 60 years and I'm still learning. But we've got to be willing to sacrifice time and energy. Instead of turning on that television, let's pray for North Korea. 
Let's pray for my brothers and sisters. Let's pray for that person who I know who's in difficulty in my street. You know, we've got to get that sort of mindset, that way of thinking. Not just worrying about, well, I've got my agenda, you know. I've got, I've got to do this, this, this and this today. And the Lord's shouting in you, just a minute, what about my agenda? You know, are you listening to what I'm saying? Says the Lord. You know, the most blessed thing is to do what God wants. Amen. But it doesn't always happen automatically, does it? We're learning. Encouraging one another to do that. So North Korea is a very tough situation. 40% of the hundreds of thousands of people in prison in North Korea, 40% of them die from starvation. That's a pretty death-like situation, isn't it? And some 3 million of the people who live in North Korea are on the edge of starvation because of what's been going on. Now, I think things are slowly improving, but it needs a lot of prayer. And we in Open Doors have been praying, we've been sending people in. We've got underground, literally underground programs going on to get people out of North Korea, cross the border into China quite often, and eventually to get them to South Korea, where they will be totally free. People who cross the Two Man River, which is the barrier between North Korea and China, uh, if they're captured on the other side, they can be executed. Or what will happen, because they're in China, they will be sent back by the Chinese authorities back into North Korea. It's a very, very tough situation. But it's wonderful how the Lord has been working and changing lives and saving lives and bringing about his plan and his purpose. North Korea, not the most recommended tourist spot in the world. <laughs> But God is working. How do they witness? Well, they do witness. One lady, the Lord told her to go and walk. She strapped her child on her back and off she went and she was walking. And she knew the Lord was going to guide her to someone to witness. She knew that. And she walked and eventually she came across a person on the road. She witnessed to them in her own language of the North Korea, gave her the gospel and then said goodbye and left. Absolutely directed of God. There are those who walk with the Lord in such a way that they just feel. I mean, I've had experiences. Haven't heard, I, well, I have heard the voice of God, just like you hear my voice now on two occasions. But mainly it's conviction. And I sense I've got to do this. The other day I needed to speak to someone in Bulgaria. And it wasn't a straightforward situation. And I was thinking about it, and all of a sudden I felt ring. And this lady is a lovely, lovely, very committed Christian, one of the senior judges, one of the top senior judges in the whole of Bulgaria, works in the uh, number one uh, um, place in, in, the, in the capital. And she answered the phone. I almost fell off my seat. I said, good morning, Mimi. She says, darn, lovely to hear you, brother. And, and, I th and I said, well, Mimi, aren't you at work? She said, now listen to this. She said, no, she said, I'm on holiday. And do you know what? Because one of the main reasons was I wanted to speak to her parents who don't speak English. So I wanted to use Mimi to translate what I wanted to say directly to her parents. And she said, I'm on holiday and my mum and dad are here with me. <laughs> now, this was totally unplanned. Now, this happened a couple of weeks ago. And it was so of the Lord. Just that little nag that you should do it when you try to plan it two weekends before and every time forgot. You know, when you get to 80, you forget things. And uh, the, Lord, the Lord just wonderfully guided. So can God guide us? Of course he can. Can he get us to do things that we normally don't do? Of course he can. But we need to be prayerful. He, he, he finds it very difficult to relate to people who are always on the rush, always looking at their agenda. Oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. You've got to spend time with the Lord, you know. Tune in, that inner ear. Let God speak to you through his word. What a privilege. And that this is the way that the whole of the church, whether it's in a persecuted situation or not, needs to function and can function. Amen. Our problem in, in this world is we're chased by doing things, aren't we? I've got to have this, I've got to have that, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And even in the church, we can get so caught up in doing things. And God is saying... 
I'm here. I'm not over there. Stop. I want to speak. I want to guide you. I want to help you. That's what the Lord is looking for for us. I want to speak to you about Pakistan a moment. And um, it's very, very difficult to be a Christian in Pakistan. It's a Muslim situation. Muslim situations vary in the sort of intensity of how difficult it can be. But the spirit of Islam is very dark and very strong and very powerful. And it is one of the most dangerous religions in the world because it tries to substitute who Jesus is. They say God has no son. You know, God is almighty God all on his own. There's no father and son and so forth. There's just God. There's no father, son, Holy Spirit, just God himself. So for many Muslims, the concept of a God who loves them is very alien. And in the, there in Pakistan, there's terrible um, discrimination against people. No Christian can hold a professional job anywhere in Pakistan. You can be a street cleaner, you can work in a shop and so forth, but being a doctor is quite rare and those sort of things. And of course, in, in being in a real place of authority, basically is a definitely no-no if you're known as a Christian. And so um, about a year ago, when, when it's Easter or Christmas, those are probably the most dangerous times, not only in Pakistan but other Islamic countries, when uh, extreme Muslim groups uh, try and cause real problems. Um, and uh, the Taliban, uh, of course, they're still around. They're not in that big strong body that they were because ISIS has been... Uh, very much dealt with, but they're still functioning at different times. And uh, it was uh, near the East, uh, Easter a year or so ago, and um, they knew it was dangerous to gather together as Christians, but they said, yeah, we're going to gather. So this church gathered together, and they, they had candles. They had, a, they had a candle, made some candles at the front, but each one was supposed to bring their own candle, which they did. But the leader of the church forgot to tell them about how to light their candles. It was just a piece of instruction. And in this report, a little six-year-old girl suddenly used her candle, lit it from one of the main candles at the front. Don't ask me why the others didn't do it, but this, is the, this was the situation. And she went round to these adults, this little six-year-old with a candle, to light their candle. And this is what she said. Because the candles remind us that even in the darkness of the tomb, there was the hope of Jesus' promise. When Jesus makes a promise, it is like a candle given to us when the lights go out. It is a promise that the lights will come back on again. And the background to that is because they regularly have power cuts, you see. And in her mind, spiritually, she made the comparison. You know, that Jesus is the light. He will always be there. He can always come back. The light will prevail. And so she did this. And uh, the next day, just to emphasise the danger, the next day, a large bomb went on uh, at a church in Lahore, which is the capital of Pakistan. 75 Christians were killed and hundreds were injured. This is the situation, not only there, but in Egypt, at different times. These very tragic situations, literally blowing up. But the Christians are not giving up. The Christians are still seeking to live for the Lord. We in open doors. In Pakistan, for instance, over the years, we have taught to read and to write over 100,000 Christians. Sometimes they're not always Christians. They can be non-Christians as well. We do extend ourselves beyond, you know, just exclusively Christian. And that's the same in Egypt. Uh, I, when I was a missionary in South America, Bolivia, um, one of the responsibilities I had for the period of time I was a teacher in our rural Bible Institute was we had Aymara and Quechua Indians coming in to study, but an, a percentage of them could not read and they could not write. Now, I'd learnt Spanish. We have to go through our language school and everything, and I knew Spanish. So one, of, one, only one of my responsibilities, and it was quite a 
demanding one, but very rewarding, was to teach a percentage of these students how to read and to write in Spanish. So this old Englishman, you know, well, I wasn't old then, I was young. <laughs> I did this. And after the first year, when they've really got hold of it and they can read and write, they start, there's what we call their formal studies of two or three years of study in the main uh, studies that they went to the Bible Institute for. And it's such a blessing to look back and think, these different ones who became pastors or living out their Christian life, able to read, what a difference. I mean, can you imagine what life would like be for you if you couldn't read or write? Well, it's just not to be able to read. I mean, what a, what a disadvantage. Even with all the helps we have, we do get a lot of help in this country, believe you me. I've been in countries where people are literally rotting to death because I can't even get an aspirin. You know, that, what a contrast. We are so cared for still in this country. Why? Because of our Christian background. But let me remind you, persecution is coming. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready. I finished with India very briefly. Well, I say I finished with India. I just can say one example from India, and one more to finish with. Um, this this man here became a believer not so long ago in India, uh, and um, he says the villagers crowded around us and started punching and kicking us all over our bodies. They asked us to praise Hindu gods and goddesses. We refused, so they kicked us harder. And this is, this is not just an isolated incident, friends. This, this is an illustration of what has happened to a number. Persecution is really growing in India. But I tell you what, the church is really growing in India. And the reason because the church is really growing, there's a growing reaction. Let me remind you, if you don't realise this, that the government in power is an extreme Hindu group and the president is an extreme Hindu. That's very sad. That's very bad news, basically, for all Indians. But you see, in a number of countries, like, if you're a Hindu, you're a real hi Indian. You got it? If you're a Hindu, you're a real Indian. If you're not a Hindu, well, you're not quite the quality. You're not really. And that's true in a number of countries. So this brother uh, was actually thrown in prison. And in prison, just very briefly, he was in prison for four days. You think, boy, he was kicked and all the rest of it. He needs four days to recover. Do you know how he recovered? He, he preached. <laughs> he, he preached in the prison. He, he, t he told people about Jesus. He says, I, pre I preached the gospel and prayed for an inmate who was sick. He was healed and received Jesus instantly. My other cellmate was a person suffering from intense depression. He kept saying that he wanted to kill himself. I prayed for him and the suicidal thoughts left him. He also accepted Jesus. The third person, he's on holiday by the way in prison, yeah. the third person I met was a young man falsely accused of raping a woman. He also used to remain very upset and felt helpless and hopeless about his life. I shared the gospel and he also accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I saw the immense power of God going on. And this is, this is an example of what's been happening to others in India. But it's costly, it's jolly painful, it's difficult, but they're not giving up. Um, just coming back to the scripture for a moment, uh, it, which we read uh, in our reading, it says, um, if I can find the, the actual, um, it says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, without giving up, without going back. Stay firm, stay strong. Don't allow anybody or anything to stop us moving forward. And this is happening with so many in our world today. How many of you have ever sung the song, I had decided to follow Jesus? I know it's a fairly old one, right? You young people have never heard of that one? Okay, that's fair enough, right? Well, it's actually at the back of the hill song, so you've probably heard it. Yeah, maybe you've heard it. It's not one of those regular ones, so we don't easily... Remember, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. The, the, the cross before me, the world behind me, I had decided to follow Jesus. I can't remember it all. Um, and, but who wrote it? 
I'll tell you the story very briefly. A man became a Christian in an Indian tribe in India, I understand, way up in whatever area it was, one of the many tribes that there are. And uh, his wife and children became Christians. So here they were, this little group. Now, as far as I know, they were probably the only Christians in that tribe. When they had gatherings, like they do, and I've been into the jungle, I've been with tribal peoples, and you will have seen it on films, it's true. If they're all going to gather together, and there's lots of them, they have a big open area. And they had the big open area, and the chief had called all the people together. They were all there together. And as they proceeded, he called this man out with his family. This was totally unexpected. And he said to him, I want you to renounce your Christian faith. He said, I hear you've become a Christian. He said, I want you to deny your faith. And he refused. He said, if you don't deny your faith, the chief said, I will kill you, your wife and your children. Very serious situation. And uh, he had with him his musical instrument. Now, I'm not sure it was a guitar, whatever it was, but it was a musical instrument. And this man, he'd written a number of songs. The Lord had given him new songs. And he started to sing right there in front of the whole tribe and before the chief in the light of this threat. And he opened his mouth and he began to sing, I have decided to Jesus, follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. And the, the chief said, if you don't deny, your wife and children will be killed before you. And that's what happened. He saw his wife and children murdered before him. And he refused to deny the Lord. And he went on singing. And there's another verse that says, although all, uh, although all forsake me, um, hmm? still, I will still I will follow. Now, can you feel the, the, the dimension of this now? It suddenly takes on a tremendous dimension. And then they killed him. They took his life. Sometime later, the Lord touched the heart of this chief and he became a believer. Gathered all the tribe together and professed his faith in Jesus Christ. Today, there is a growing church in that tribe. Costly, difficult, Yes, but God has done the impossible. No wavering, no turning back. Just totally trusting in him. Well, my time is up. Let's pray, shall we, a moment, before I pass the time back to Julian. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being your children. We thank you that you are our rock, you are our anchor, you are our hope. And we thank you for the testimony of your children. We Thank you for those courageous men and women who are part of our family in Jesus. And we pray particularly for those right in prison now in many countries who are suffering. Those who've been given an ultimatum to deny or die. And many have laid down their lives, Lord. they rather died than deny you. And so give us courage and help us to be ready for whatever's going to happen, even today and in the days ahead. And accept our praise that we can help our brothers and sisters to pray and support. Lead us and guide us and help us to honour you by honouring them. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Amen.